Hey, this is uh, Fred in Alaska. Thanks for joining me today. And um, if you don't mind, Mike, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, share. Hey, this is Mike. Out on a remote island here in Alaska. And I got a few things I'd like to share. About a couple of experiences and some stories that I learned from my grandfather. My grandfather was born in 1904. When he was a young kid, he was told stories of a um, hairy man out and about that would pick up and eat children if they misbehaved and not listen to their parents and were out past dark. Grandfather stated to me that one night, a bunch of kids were going missing, and the shaman decided to go and confront this hairy man. There was like nine children had gone missing in one night. Shaman managed to kill the hairy man and slit open the stomach, and out come all these children. They have absolutely no hair and no recollection of what had happened to them earlier in the evening. Yeah, no. Uh, from uh, my own experience. Excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say, so uh, this particular area you're from, there, there's a, la uh, a long ancestral history of, you know, these types of occurrences and, and the warnings for kids and whatnot. Yes, yes. Okay, well, please continue. I'll, I'll, I'll try to interrupt as minimally as possible. Uh, from one of my own experiences, I know this has nothing to do with the hairy man, but this happened about 11 or 12 years ago. There were these three houses being built, and a friend of mine asked to take along probably about two or three in the morning, extremely dark out in the middle of winter, make sure that nobody was breaking into these brand new houses that were being built. While we were in the very last bedroom, checking out all the material for the house, we heard some banging on an oil drum next door and we kind of thought it was kids telling the other kids, hey, it's time to get out of the house, there are people next door. So we all ran out single file and in the snow so we can keep everybody from sinking in the snow. It was pretty. And we all had flashlights and headlamps and we got to where the oil drum was and we noticed these little footprints going up, which looked like had little handprints right above those. And we turned around and we looked. And there were maybe a couple hundred footprints, like people were running around. There were these two Conix vans. One Conix van was closer to the road. The one that we were looking at was right in front of the house that we were checking on. And there's a little snowbank about three and a half foot high to where it looked like someone walked to the edge, dropped down to their rear end, and slid down. There were three of these. And the footprints ran heading out to the road and then out onto the ice of the Bering Sea. And that's just one of the experiences. Yeah. It, Another it, one is where later on in the week, or people were sitting on this conics van in the middle of the night, and the door had gotten slammed on them. They were locked in. Passerby heard them knocking on the wall of the conics van, opened up the door. They all came out with their flashlights and saw a little person running away behind a different car expand from where they had just come out from. 
Uh, these people were really scared back then. We didn't have any cell phones. It was about a year before cell phones came out to this island. We yeah. have absolutely no trees. Right. A lot of islands up here are windswept. Like I know uh, in Unalaska Dutch Harbor, you, you're lucky to find a little scrub pine, you know? Yeah, we don't even have willows out here. Right, <laughs> right. No, go ahead and continue. About a day or two later, I was driving around in a side-by-side -side and I had noticed down by the school area where he coming off the ground about a 15-foot utilidor that was made out of wood. And every four feet on top of the utilidor going through the side and around the, around the entire utilidor was a six by two, two by four, so every Four feet would have been a utility door, and I had a flashlight with me, and I was turning the corner, and I looked, and I thought what I thought was a maybe an eight or nine year old child running on the utility door, but when I hit my flashlight, this person was on top of each two by six board, running extremely fast. It, got out of the way of my flashlight and I couldn't see it anymore. And in the background against the wall, there was a street light so I could see the shadow of this person literally jump off the utility door and it's about a 15 foot drop. Uh, so back about 12 years ago is when I started hearing all these little people that they come down in uh, the fall after everybody's hang drying their meat and their meat's about eight, nine feet up off the ground hanging on the side of their houses, a lot of the meat would go missing. Um, from my understanding, an elder lady was out in her herdic entry and she was doing something in her Arctic entryway. She only had her reading glasses on, didn't have her prescription glasses with the bifocals on. She had heard a little kid crying out. And she opened up her door and looked, and there's a comics van across the street that's kind of dented in. Uh, she thought that a little kid may have been hurt. She stated to me that this little kid was all dressed in seal skin from head to toe and a seal skin backpack on. She walked up to the child and was asking in the native tongue, hey, are you okay? Are you okay? Hey, you, are you okay? Tapped the little child on the shoulder. Child kind of looked at her and then just ran away really fast, faster than she's ever seen anybody run in her life. Um, back then, I believe she was in her 70s. Now I believe she's in her 80s, mid-80s. Uh, there are a few other incidences where people would hear knocking coming from underneath their houses. And people would go to look and they wouldn't find anything but just a bunch of little footprints running around. Uh, there's another time where one of the former uh, firemen believed that he had caught a photo of one of these. Come to find out, it happened to be an Arctic fox. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, is there any uh, oral history of them shape shifting? Because I know down Bristol Bay, uh, there's uh, uh, stories of them shape shifting into fox, rabbit, uh, things of this nature, wolverine. Uh, is there any of that in your uh, oral history there? Um, I heard in the past that the shaman 
around here was able to shapeshift, uh, go into his trance, and he would grow ivory tusks out of this underneath his cheeks, right and left cheek, and he was able to fly. But if someone saw him flying, he would fall to the ground. So he would only do that while he's on his own. Gotcha. Uh, gotcha. My grandfather told me this story one day that when he was about 13, him and his father went out hunting one day and he had mentioned to his dad he wanted to go and check out the seal blind. His father told him not to be so long. He went to the edge of the coast and was just coming up on this bank and got on his stomach and was crawling on his elbows and heard some voices. He picked his head up and over the bank that goes down onto the beach and into the water. Uh, my grandfather saw an older man. Well, it wasn't, to him, it looked like a kid teaching a little uh, smaller person how to hunt. And he said it had a little canoe, like carved out out of uh, driftwood. And it was really small, probably about four and a half to five foot long driftwood to him that looked like it was carved out. And he couldn't tell if they had any tools or anything, but they had, he noticed the rope was made out of sinew that they were using. And they started pulling up towards the beach. At first, he, my grandfather couldn't see what they were pulling up. It was just tied up into the rope into the water. and. All of a sudden, he could see a tail pop up. And it was the tail end of a whale. And they started pulling it up slowly, slowly, until it got all the way up onto the beach. He recognized it as a bowhead whale. And that's when he got extremely scared and nervous, turned around and ran back to his father, told him what he saw. And his father told him, uh, don't be telling any fibs, you know, um, back then I don't think there was any word for lying. Uh, don't be telling stories, pretty much. Right. Hmm. And, uh, I believe his father knew what he was talking about, just didn't want to say anything. Um, there's a bunch of other stories of little villages on this island of little people, but every year they move so they don't get seen. And I believe there may be a hairy man on this island, maybe one or two, because back in 1988 when I went to high school here, I was living with my oldest brother out in his house and from his front door is towards the airport. And I had seen someone walking on the other side of the runway, which is probably a quarter mile from where the house is to the runway. Uh, the runway is further back, and I thought I recognized who it was. So I ran inside and grabbed a pair of binoculars, and it was bigger than I thought it was when I looked at binoculars. It had a big hunchback and a big head. It had a lot of hair and I could see fur coming down from its hands and it was taking these extremely big strides. At first I was awestruck just watching it and I decided to go get my nephew before behind another house. I went and I woke him up. It was about seven o'clock in the morning uh, we ran outside to go look. We ran behind the house where it went behind, a uh, quarter mile behind the last house from where I saw it, and all of a sudden it was gone. I had 
break in the snow machine about three days before that, so I didn't get a chance to drive out there. The snow back in the area with the runway is it's extremely deep if you're just walking and so I had no snowshoes so I wouldn't be able to make it out there. I wanted to check out the footprints but uh I I just couldn't do it so I didn't bother heading out that way. Right. I um, I had a quick question for you, Mike. Um is there any uh history of caves on the island? Um up up in the mountains or anything like that? When I was going to school here, there was a local kid that would pick on me because I'm not originally from this island. I'm from the mainland of Alaska, but my family's from here, so I came here and he was picking on me really bad. His father had told him to give me a call, apologize, and take me for a ride on the snow machine. Took me out onto the airport and uh, the runway lights were off. We're out of town. Back then, there was only three street lights and house lights. There were no street lights or anything like that, so it's extremely dark. Uh, he pointed up onto the side of the mountain. Uh, this was before the BIA road was built, which leads out of town to go to a digging site into the gravel pit. Uh, there was a light flickering off in the distance. Uh, he was telling me that there's a cave over there where a hairy man lives. And I, at the time, I just thought he was trying to scare me. This was about a month before I saw that person walking by the runway area. So I didn't believe him. I thought he was just trying to scare me. And I was thinking, how could a hairy man make fire in the middle of winter? You know, and got back on the snow machine and to him, he said he saw an Arctic fox and we started chasing it. We crashed the snow machine. <laughs> he started saying, oh, my father's going to kill me. My father's going to kill me. We got it back up on the track and the skis and we drove back into town. And he dropped me off, but... I went looking for this so-called cave just a few years ago. I've been back on the island now about 18 years, and BIA Road was now built, so I drove out there. Uh, the mountain was further than I thought, and I would keep getting stuck in the marsh and everything, so I just decided to turn around and come back into town. But uh, my wife and my oldest daughter and my youngest daughter had an encounter just uh, two years ago, right before the pandemic hit. They were out picking berries and on their way back into town. My wife noticed something coming off the hillside, which is probably from the trail she was on to the end of the rocky hillside is probably about 700 yards, 900 yards. Less than a thousand, I know that. She watched it walking down. She looked to my two daughters, or our two daughters, and had asked, do you two see that? Uh, both her daughters looked up and said, no, Mom, your mind's just playing tricks on you. They get further down the trail, and my wife looks over again to her left, and this time, they all see it. And my wife starts hitting the throttle on the four-wheeler a bit quicker on the trail. At this time, she's probably doing about 14 or 15 miles an hour, she was telling me what was done at the and. She estimated this to be about seven to eight foot tall, black in color, very scraggly hair, and with its strides, it was keeping up with the four-wheeler like it was. It wasn't in a jog, but it was in a 
you know, like a nice walking stride and kept up with a four-wheeler. And uh, this is about three miles out of town to the east, east of town. Um, our youngest daughter, her friend and her mother were about 400 yards behind them on their four-wheeler coming back in town. And our dump site is probably a mile and a half east. So there's a trail that goes out to where you pick berries. You can take the dump road and head out that way. Or just before you hit the dump road, you can take the coastline to go pick berries. My wife and them were coming back on the dump road area. So my wife and them made it in town. Uh, my daughter's friend and mother, the daughter was telling the mother, Mom, do you see that? Do you see that? That man right there, that big man right there. The mother didn't stop the four-wheeler. She just looked behind and said, No, no, I don't see it. I'm not sure if she was trying to appease her daughter to make her feel comfortable. But she didn't stop the four-wheeler. She just kept going. She looked back for a second and said, No, I don't see it. So as they're driving, my daughter's friend pulled out her cell phone and snapped a picture of it. The, well, when you look in the picture, it looks like a really small dot against the background of the tundra and the hill. So I made a picture as wide as I could and as big as it would pop up and you can see a big silhouette of a black figure standing there. Um, I'll, I'll email you or send you the uh, pictures you can post online if you like. But as far as I know, in all the years I've been out here and over the years of hearing things like this, this is the very first evidence besides seeing the little people and seeing this hairy man, this is the first, you know, besides seeing with my own eyes, telling somebody else you're gonna think I'm nuts. This picture alone, I think, I don't know if it'd be proof to a lot of people out there, but to me, I believe it. Um, yeah, for, for me, I'm... Thing is, I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, for me, I, I, I mean, evidence is evidence for, for a lot of people, but uh, like yourself, I already know uh, as far as the existence of, of these, these creatures and whatnot. Um, definitely please send that pic, and um, I'll either use it as a thumbnail or post it at the, on the website because I have uh, a photo album of there, you know, on the website as well, so I'll make sure that the viewers can, can check it out for themselves. <laughs> Oh, um, another thing, um, the following year, just last year, uh, after my wife and two daughters saw that creature coming down off the hillside, my wife and oldest daughter went to the, up the BIA, BIA road, up past the gravel pit, up to the side of the mountain where they pick crystals. And... At first, they heard an extremely loud scream, which my wife chalked it up to being maybe uh, an Arctic fox in heat or something. And in between these two mountains is a trail that heads out to a camp that is 19 miles out. So when they first heard it, it sounded like it was behind the mountain. The second time when they heard it, it was extremely loud and sounded like it was coming in between the valley of the two mountains. So by the time my wife looked up, our oldest daughter was on the four-wheeler saying, uh, Mom, it's time to go. Uh, less than a week later, it's dark out. I come outside to smoke a cigarette out on the porch. And to my left, when 
sounds like it was coming from underneath the house. And I just dismissed it as maybe the neighbor's dog. But I've never heard a dog growl like that. I've heard wolves and everything growl. I've heard foxes growl. But I've never heard anything. This, the octave on this thing was really low and mumbly, but it just went on longer than like how a wolf or a dog would sound. So I just dismissed it, went inside, didn't bother telling my family about it. The next night I came out here and it was around the same time, maybe about 2.30 in the morning. It's dark out, but it's not yet winter, it's fall time. And I could hear it again. And so this time I kind of yelled, I went to, hey, go home, you know, I thought I was a neighbor's dog, I told it to go home and finished up my cigarette, went back inside. The third night, I went back outside and the same thing happened. And I have not yet told my wife or my kids about it. I didn't want them to freak out. My wife went out after and she goes, babe, there's something growling underneath the porch on the left side once you open the door. So I knew at that time, I wasn't the only one that, that could hear it. So I went and I grabbed my pistol and my flashlight and there was no snow at this time, uh, probably about this time of year, you know, when it starts to get dark. Uh, so I couldn't find any footprints or anything like that. And it was right before I got my big dog that's out front. Right. Uh, do you remember and any uh, any weird smells involved with that? A any kind of a stench or oh. anything? Or Okay. When... Yeah, actually, there was a kind of like a musty smell, but it's not like, you know, when you cruise the coastline around here, you'll come across carcasses of walrus, you know, or whale or, right. you know, seal, stuff like that. It kind of smelled like that, but it was a heavier smell, like it was uh, not just rotting flesh, but like... Uh, like, say, if you had a dog and you haven't washed it in a long time and it was rolling around in something like a carcass or something and it yeah. never had gotten washed, yeah. it was kind of something like that. Kind of like past, and past rotten, find, that, that past rotten smell to where it's just that musty dead smell? Yeah, yeah, but it's like if your dog went and rolled around in a whale carcass or something and you didn't bother washing them. Right. And it's got all the hair matted and everything. And, you know, it would be something like that. That's the best way I can explain it. But uh, I had noticed I have dairy jugs underneath the house that I had moved from down there to inside my Arctic entryway that I used for heating fuel. Those were all tipped over. Luckily, they weren't filled up with uh, heating fuel. I have them all tied up with a rope around one of the bases of the leg of the house and I don't have any skirting around the house so just about anything can crawl under there and uh, they were all knocked over uh, the rope wasn't tied it looked like someone cut it you know how rope mushrooms out yeah. when it's cut it was kind of like that but it, you know they were scattered everywhere they were knocked over uh, we didn't hear anything crawling underneath the house in those three days. Uh, whatever was out there, when my wife and daughter were picking up crystals, I think maybe it had followed them home. Because we're kind of like the last house closest to the school besides the teacher's housing, which is probably 200 75 yards away from where we are, and they're closer to the water than we are. We're the very last house um, by the... So I had a feeling it may have followed them home. Yeah, that's, that's a creepy thought to think that something that large would uh, take the time and energy to, to track someone down, um, kind of singling someone out, you know? Yeah, uh, 
I, I couldn't tell you if it's the same thing that they saw two years ago or what they heard. Because from the place they saw it on the east side to where they heard the screams on the west side is at least a good 15 miles away from each other. Because uh, where they berry pick from here is a good five to seven miles to the east where we were getting the stuff from uh, the mountainside is probably about a good seven or eight miles. You go about four miles down the coast and about three or four miles inland until you get to the mountain to where we pick our crystals. So okay. we haven't gone back out there. Uh, my wife and I have just recently. We've gone up towards the back mountain where we get the crystals and just yesterday went out and berry picked but there were quite a few berry pickers out there so we weren't too freaked out about it. Gotcha. Uh was And I don't ever I don't ever leave the village unarmed. I mean at first I used to, you know, doing search and rescue and stuff like that, but ever since I got my firearms I do not leave the no, I don't blame you, especially with those kind of things going on. Now, um, overall, is, is there um, uh, a long history of like little people occurrences and whatnot in the area? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's been going on for, I'd say, I don't know, there's been people on this island for the last 12, 15,000 years. It's probably been going on ever since then. Okay. My grandfather used to tell me stories about it. Do you uh, you remember they, any of they things? They have the. Oh, I'm, so, I'm oh, sorry. Like the one where those two were pulling up the whale. Right. He was. He that his father once told him that one little person has a strength of uh, ten or twelve men. So if you ever run across one of them, um, offer them food or offer them water. Don't ever try to attack it or trap it or be mean to it. Um, there was a local man out here about 25 years back had gotten into a three-wheeler accident and was unconscious. It was probably about 13 miles inland on the tundra. And he woke up for a little bit and started thinking that he's going to die right there. Nobody's not going to know where he is because back then, you know, didn't have any emergency beacons or alarms or anything like that. No cell phones. Only had a handheld VHF that couldn't cross over the mountains. <laughs> when he finally comes to, he notices that when he turns to his left and he looks the ground is moving towards his feet and he turns to his right and the ground is still moving to his feet. He's still laying down on his back. And he realizes that he's being carried by something. Or then four feet off the ground. Uh, these little people found him and walked him over the mountains, and he passed back out, but he woke up on the runway. And mm -hmm. uh, a few people from town found him and brought him over to the clinic. And to this day, he swears it was the little people that saved him. Wow, see, uh, it's cool to hear experiences like that as far as them rescuing people, because I know back home, uh, they're known to, uh, it's said that they'll steal your soul, uh, things, things of that nature. Um, like on, uh, January 17th, you got to cover your mirrors when you go out and take a steam bath and something about the, the veil between the two worlds being thinner at that point. And, uh, that's when you run the risk of getting your, your, uh, either they'll lure you, lure you away or, uh, steal your soul. So it's nice to hear, uh other versions and other uh 
types of experiences with uh you know like the little people or especially the hairy man i i typically only hear uh not good stories you know i never hear of anyone saying i had a calming feeling or anything like that it's typically you know uh a fear of their life or being spoke to te uh, telepathically and stuff like that i've heard stories like that too before but as far as i know nobody's uh really close encounter with the hairy man out here just uh, being seen right uh, screams stuff like that and with the little people from what my grandfather was telling me you know show them respect offer them food uh, offer them water don't mean to them uh, don't try and trap them don't try to catch one because they can turn vicious uh, when I moved back out here, there was an elder. Uh, again, this time of year, uh, lived across the street from uh, one of the only two-story buildings in town, and that is where the street light is, is on the other side of the road. He had noticed someone crawling <laughs> on their hands and knees and heard them crying so the elder got up from his porch and this time it was probably about one o'clock in the morning so it's dark uh, walked over to the person and asking in our language hey are you okay are you okay uh, the person was wearing a red jacket with the hood over their head and the person, without looking at him, got up onto his knees, or her knees, I don't know, and removed the hood from their face and put it like halfway up their head. And it had a, what he said it looked like a, a fur ruff on it. And when that person looked up to look at the elder, that person did not have a face at all. No eyes, no nose, no mouth, no cheekbones. It was just an oval, egg-shaped, smooth face. And he said something in the native language, turned around, didn't bother looking back, and went straight into his house. Yeah, shoot, I, I would too. Is that the only account you've ever heard of uh, the faceless being? Uh, that account, yeah, that was probably about a year after I had moved back. I have no reason not to believe this elder, because uh, he's just a, probably about 10 or 15 years younger than my grandfather. And he was, you know, around here, you're raised not to lie. But, you know, nowadays everybody's lying every other day. Yeah, it, it's it's unfortunate, and, and you know I'm really I'm really thankful you're willing to uh, share your uh, experiences in your own voice. There's a lot of people, understandably, that uh, especially in our native cultures, that tend to shy away from it. You know, just because of the ridicule or um, it, just, you you know how it is. No one no one wants to be viewed yeah, as oh, a, yeah. a psychopath or a, you know some kind of lying weirdo. And so I, I appreciate you uh, being willing to uh, share if that. those people out there don't want to believe it, well, then they'd have to come out here and see it or find out for themselves. I mean, that's the only way they're going to... I mean, if they're just sitting on the couch looking at the Internet and not hmm. doing anything and putting other people down, then they have no clue. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. I mean, that's all they experience. Right. Hey, uh, my, my camera's about to lose its power and whatnot. Uh, stay on the phone for uh, for me a second here, and, and, and I'm going to talk to you off camera. But I, I would like to thank Mike for joining us today, um, sharing experiences uh, about the little people and, and the hairy man and stuff. And uh, we'll catch you guys on the next one.